And so without further ado, our first keynote speaker for this session is Dr. Maria Nera from the World Health Organization. And I'm going to invite her on stage and you know, let her inspire you and give you a little bit of um, what it takes to run an organization whose stated purpose is healthcare for all. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Nera on stage. I will leave you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, they told me not to move too much, and this is an uh, impossible mission for me. Uh, but anyway, if you see me moving too much, please ask me to stay. It's really a privilege and, uh, to see on a place that is called Heroes of Change, because this is exactly what I am trying to do every single day. And all of us who work on public health, this is exactly what we plan every morning. How can I become a hero of change? Obviously, the positive change, not any change and at any price. Let me maybe start, uh, I, I am supposed to make the connections for you between climate change and human health. And it looks like even if for many years we have been talking about climate change and health, we have been saying that the climate crisis is a health crisis. I think still this connection between our health and the climatic conditions, it takes a little difficulty to make uh, uh, everybody in agreement. So let me maybe start by, by setting the scene on a very, very simple way. Imagine a mosquito. Everybody knows a mosquito. Don't tell me that you don't have mosquitoes in France, even in Paris. I've been living here and I can testify that there are horrible mosquitoes in summertime. Well, imagine this mosquito called Anopheles, and um, his job is to uh, go find a female and make sure that this female will transmit malaria. Imagine another mosquito transmitting dengue. All of those little mosquitoes and vectors will find fantastic opportunities when we have an increase in the temperature, when we have a global warming. Where you are living in, in Nairobi, for instance, or outside Nairobi, normally you will have already a prevalence of malaria cases that you, every year, you more or less know how many there will be. Well, now what we are seeing is that in the cases of uh, uh, Kenya, for instance, in places where before the mosquitoes didn't have the perfect conditions to reproduce, now they do. So those mosquitoes, we are making them extremely happy because they can reproduce, have a very nice life, find a female, make a lot of children, and therefore transmitting the malaria. It's not a joke. This is happening already in many places around the world. As soon as you increase the temperature by two degrees centigrade, those vectors transmitting diseases are finding the perfect conditions for uh, reproducing and transmitting those diseases. It can be dengue, it can be malaria. Let me give you another example. If you are living in a place, and this is the case for many millions around the world now, where you work outside, put yourself in New Delhi, outside New Delhi, you are a construction worker, and the conditions uh, during their uh, season for them, the, the hot season, might reach 45 degrees, 47 degrees. It's already a very challenging situation. In, imagine that this temperature will increase yet another two degrees. That is really a drama for uh, many, many millions of people working outside and making already very difficult to survive those heat waves. In our case, in Europe here, you will have very vulnerable people, very old people or very young people, or people with diseases who, again, if they are in front of a heat wave, they will suffer and they will be challenged, dehydrated, and not responding uh, as the way we should to all of those uh, changes in temperature. We are even talking that in the cities, we probably need to start to put in place, in cities like Paris, what we call the climatic refu refuge, refuge climatique. 
because people will not know where to go if they don't have air conditioning at home or if they are uh, economically not uh, strong enough to be able to have a good refrigeration cooling system. Imagine now another thing, our lungs. Our lungs normally, when you are 20 years old, they have a beautiful pink color. Means that they have not been exposed to tobacco. Well, maybe if you are 20 years old, maybe they have been already exposed to tobacco. But imagine that this a young guy or girl that they never smoke. Those lungs should be pink, beautifully pink. Well, today is not the case anymore. We can have 20-year-old young people in our, uh, any place around the world where their lungs are not anymore pink, even if they never smoke. They have the lungs of a 60-year-old heavy smoker for many years. And why is that? Because of air pollution. We are living on an exposure, on a permanently exposure to the toxic air that we are breathing. Of course, not, it's not the same. Um, going beyond the recommended standards of WHO here in Paris, that maybe we go for two, three times more than the recommended standards, depending the time of the year. Or if you live in, in Shanghai or, or, or Beijing, where sometimes those levels will be multiplying even by 20 times uh, and of course, India as well, even by, by 20 times the levels that WHO, the World Health Organization, recommend or recognize are the ones that will be protecting your health. In addition to that, imagine that you are living in Africa, you are cultivating a land, you are producing food, you have some water, even if it's becoming more scarce, and one day you have an extreme weather event that extreme weather event will destroy the land that you are cultivating, and therefore you don't produce food. They will destroy it maybe and make access to the clean water more and more difficult. And you know what water scarcity means for health. It means more diarrheal diseases, more uh, um, cholera, for instance. We have at the moment, we are talking 23 countries around the world declaring a cholera outbreak. Of course, we have cholera outbreaks every year, but with this increase on the temperature, with this global warming, we are more and more seeing that places that they have access to sources of water, at least, and some sanitation, they are losing that access to the, the, the water and the sanitation. So that means an increase on the prevalence of those diseases transmitted by water, transmitted by air, and transmitted by vectors. I think this gives you already a, a, a kind of picture why the health community, the World Health Organization, and many others, why the health professionals, we are so much concerned about climate change. For us, it's not just the question that the polar bears, which are lovely and adorable, who doesn't like a polar bear, but we are concerned about our lungs. We are concerned about our brain because that toxic air that is resulting toxic because we are using the combustion of fossil fuels and that combustion of fossil fuels is resulting on elevating the greenhouse gases emissions, but at the same time they are contributing to this air pollution. So therefore, for us, when we think about climate change, what we see are our brains affected by that toxic air and therefore causing degenerative diseases, uh, de uh, decrease on the cognitive development. We are becoming, even reducing our IQ, you know? The toxicity of the air we breathe, if it's very polluted, we now have more and more studies telling us that it's having an, uh, an impact even on our IQ and neurodegenerative uh, diseases like Alzheimer or others. So careful with that because we are joking with our health. 
the health of our lungs, the health of our brain, and the health of our cardiovascular system, stroke, and many other diseases. This is maybe the negative part, the one that I don't want to be apocalyptic, but uh, if somebody needed to understand why we are so committed and engaged on climate change, this is the reason, because it's touching all the bases for, for, for our health, all the pillars that maintain our health, access to food, access to clean water, access to clean air, and of course, the possibility to cultivate, having nutrition, and having a shelter, and not being forced to go for a massive migration, which is happening now in many occasions, and altering as well our mental health. That's the kind of negative picture. But let me now tell you, take you to something a little bit more positive. When I started my, my career as a public health officer, I was in Mozambique and we were having cholera outbreaks very often. So normally what's happened is that the first days when we were starting to have some cholera cases, everybody was going out and saying, there is a cholera outbreak, there is a cholera outbreak. So we were all, there is a cholera outbreak, there is a cholera outbreak. And I learned it, it took me very little, but I learned it forced by the situation that you cannot just go outside and say there is a cholera outbreak. You need to go outside and say there is a cholera outbreak and this is what you have to do. You have to chlorinate the water you drink and for that, you will have chlorine that will be distributed at this point. So please, citizens that wanted to chlorinate their water, go to this point of distribution. Those are the places where you can have clean water and disinfect it already. Please wash your uh, hands with this soap that this will be distributed in this point. Please cook your food. Please make sure that you, uh, if you have symptoms, and those are the symptoms, go to the hospital or go to this place, get rehydrated. I mean, essentially what you have to do is engage the communities and tell them how can they, how can they be engaged, contributing, and of course doing something about climate change. So that's why the health community is now working not only at the hospital level. So we don't want just to go to the hospital or healthcare facilities and say, okay, we need to be ready because we know that we will have an increase in the number of dengue cases or malaria cases or diarrhea or cholera or many other uh, obstructive uh, pulmonary chronic diseases, asthma and lung cancer caused by all of that. We don't want to do only that. We want to go upstream and try to reduce the causes of this type of things and reduce all of this and do what we call in medicine primary prevention, which is the basis of everything. Alors, what is the primary prevention on this case? What is the strategy similar to the cholera one? It will be telling the citizens, anytime you take the, the, your private car, be aware that you can do much better. You can take a public transport, maybe you can use a bicycle, maybe you can walk, because anytime you take a car, you are contributing to those emissions, particularly if your car is, is using fossil fuels. Anytime you are not recycling, you are as well contributing to a bad waste management, and therefore you are contributing to destroy the environment, to make sure that we have tons, millions of tons of plastics in the water and in, in our fish coming to your body, and then uh, having the situation that we have today where we find uh, microplastics, even the placenta of the children. But we can tell as well, those citizens, use your vote. Use your vote to influence this politics. There are many things that you can do as an individual. It's clear. You can uh, disseminate the message, you can engage others, you can become vegetarian or at least uh, reduce the meat uh, consumption, you can become uh, much more environmentally friendly on the transport you are using. But you can as well use your vote to make sure that you will vote those who have good policies on fighting climate change. And fighting climate change and air pollution is almost the same. It will be very much about three 
very important transitions that we all as citizens, we need to push for. The first transition is the transition to sustainable, renewable sources of energy. We need clean sources of energy. There is no reason why we cannot accelerate this transition to solar panels, to, to renewables, and the things are happening now. Imagine 10 years ago, uh, they were telling us, no, we need big technology to do that. Today, we are accelerating in this transition. The problem is that we are not accelerating at the speed that the, 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 the magnitude of the problem will require and not with the ambition that this will require, but it's possible. There is no reason why in Africa, 50% of the healthcare facilities we have at the moment, they don't have electricity in a healthcare facility. So imagine yourself going to the hospital here and uh, l'hôpital uh, Saint-Pétrière, uh, or Saint-Louis, or Cochin, or, uh, some of those very nice hospitals here in Paris, and they will tell you, no, sorry, we cannot uh, do surgery because we don't have electricity. This is uh, absolutely unacceptable here, but it's the reality in many places around the world. Women are still cooking with uh, solid fossil fuels, I mean, with coal, with uh, wood that they collect for three hours a day in order to cook like in the Stone Age. They cook like in the Stone Age on an open fire, they put whatever they found, and then they cook for hours, for hours. Of course, they don't go for, to school. And that combustion of those uh, fuels will generate this toxic air that then it will go into our lungs and cause all the damage that I have described. So unless we accelerate this transition to clean sources of energy, making sure that at the household level, when you and I, in the morning, we want a coffee, we just do click. But for many women around the world, this click takes at, at least a three hours collecting wood, preparing, preparing the fire, and this is the way they can cook or heat the house. So this transition needs to happen. We need our healthcare facilities in Africa electrified with solar panels. There is no reason why Africa cannot have solar panels. Solar energy is for free. The technology prices are now going very, very much down, and we can do a lot on all of this. The other transition we need is the one on sustainable food systems. We need to look at the whole chain, how we produce our food, avoiding pesticides, avoiding uh, trade that is unnecessary with uh, wildlife animals, for instance, or all of this uh, uh, transport of food from one part of the continent to another, which is as well not contributing to the, 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 the healthy and sustainable development we all want. And we need the transition to healthy urban planning. Our cities need to change completely because this is where our health is very much at risk or protected. I want to finish with something I want to read for you because I was thinking on these heroes of change and I was looking at uh, the, the, the fact that we need a revolution here. It's a positive and healthy revolution to change all of these things in the name of our health. And then I look at the definition of revolution and I thought that it was perfect for this uh, opportunity. In political science, revolution is a rapid fundamental and transformation of our societies, state, class, ethnic, or religious structure. In this case, we need to change the structures and making it more sustainable. And then it involves social mobilization efforts to change through non-institutionalized means. So I think this is exactly the point we have here. We have representative of our society that they want this change and this change is the one that will finally generate and protect all of our health. Thank you very much and please go for the revolution.